The World Cup is nearly at an end, and that means that the Premier League will be starting soon. But the World Cup and the Premier League are not mutually exclusive. And so the big question we have to ask is, what impact is the World Cup going to have on the Premier League? And if you want to catch all of our Premier League coverage as it drops, then make sure you're subscribed to this channel, press the bell notification button below me on the screen, and then every time we drop new content, it will go directly into your feed. So on the board in front of me here, I've got the breakdown of Premier League sides per player that they've sent to the World Cup. So we've got, on the one hand, Manchester City, they've got 16 players that they've sent to the World Cup, and then it ranges all the way down the league to right at the bottom here, Southampton, Bournemouth, Crystal Palace, they only have two players at the World Cup. Now there's a few interesting things to point out here. Obviously the teams with the most players at the World Cup are some of the better sides, so the Manchester sides, Chelsea, Spurs, Arsenal. But there are a few outliers. Liverpool have only sent seven players to the World Cup and they're below Brighton in that respect, so that could throw up some interesting things. And then Newcastle here, only five players sent to the World Cup, but Newcastle are actually currently in the top four in the Premier League, so questions about whether or not they could benefit from only sending a few players. And then to the right of the chart then, these teams that are generally towards the bottom of the Premier League table, they haven't sent many players to the World Cup. The big question is going to be that six week break that they've had, they have time to rest and recuperate, work with their manager. Is that going to be enough then to impel them up the table, get them away from the relegation battle? So there's going to be an impact there as well. But it's not just about how many players you have at the World Cup, it's about how many minutes those players are playing. So I've got a really nice viz here that's made for me by a guy called Steve Fenn at Stat Hunting on Twitter. Really useful chart for me because it aggregates all of the minutes played by players at the World Cup into their clubs. And as we can see here, all 20 clubs in the Premier League have sent a player through to the World Cup, but also the minutes really stand out here. So you can see 28,000 minutes for Premier League players at the World Cup. That is more than double of any of the closest leagues to that. So La Liga here, 14,000 minutes. And Bundesliga 11,000, Serie A 11,000, even though Italy didn't make the World Cup. So still an impressive turnout from Serie A. And then Ligue 1 only 8,000, just pushing 9,000 minutes here. So the Premier League is taking a big aggregate of those minutes at the World Cup. And as we can see, Manchester City, the team that had the most players at the World Cup from the Premier League, is also picking up the most minutes. So those players are important to their international teams. They're over a thousand minutes more than Manchester United who are the second team down. So let's just take a look at how the minutes break down for Manchester City. So on the board in front of me, we've got a Manchester City starting 11 in front of us. And as you can see, big chunks of minutes all the way across the board. Now there are some outliers here, Edison, didn't start in goal for Brazil, so he only picked up 90 minutes in a group stage game, so he's fairly rested. But across the rest of the board, pretty much players over 300 minutes, apart from Carl Walker, Phil Foden, Kevin De Bruyne obviously playing for Belgium and they were disappointing, so they dropped out fairly early on. But it's not just across the starting eleven that there's big chunks of minutes. We can see across the subs bench as well, players getting more minutes than we might have expected. Nathan Aki getting a lot of minutes for the Netherlands and Julian Alvarez getting a lot of game time as well for Argentina. But the big outlier here, I think, is this man here, Erling Haaland, the star of the first half of the Premier League season, scoring a lot of goals. He did not go to the World Cup because Norway did not make it. So he's had six weeks to rest up, six weeks to work with his manager. So what are we going to expect from him once the Premier League season kicks off again? So the biggest impact from the World Cup on the Premier League is going to be on those players who've played a chunk of minutes in the World Cup, not having a break like the rest of the players in the Premier League and then coming straight back into the Premier League season. So I've got a quote here from Declan Rice speaking before the World Cup who said, I worked out last year from June 2021 to June 2022. I played 68 games. That is an obscene amount of games. I don't go into a game and don't give 100%. Every game I walk off and I am knackered. So this is Declan Rice talking the year before the World Cup. He played around 68 games in that season, so if he matches that this season and then adds on his England games, he's going to be in the mid-70s. That's a huge amount of games to be playing. And I just wanted to give you a visual representation of what Declan Rice's schedule has looked like over the last couple of months. So this is November 2022 and December 2022, these are the games that Declan Rice played in. A couple of Premier League games just before the World Cup starts. There was a Europa League game midweek in this week, so he could have played that, but he was rested. There's also a domestic cup in the midweek here, so he could feasibly have played four games before the World Cup kicked off. He gets a week rest where he's working with the England team to prepare for the World Cup, and then he has this flurry of games, so you've got Iran, USA, Wales in the group stages. Then on the Sunday, a game against Senegal in the round of 16. 
the France quarter-final, which England lose, and so he then has two weeks of break before the Premier League kicks off again. But had he carried on playing, had England won that game, then he would have had a semi-final on Wednesday, and then if they'd have won that game, a uh, World Cup final on the Sunday. So the players who are still in the World Cup, who will be playing in the semi-final and the World Cup final, will only have a week off before they go back, depending on which league they're in. So they say, really, really intense schedule and the players are just really not getting much of a break whatsoever. And when players get tired, they are more likely to get injured. And so this man is the main casualty from the World Cup. Gabriel Jesus was playing for Brazil, gets injured, he's out for a couple of months. And that means that Arsenal, who are top of the table in the Premier League, the five point gap above Manchester City, have now lost one of their star players. They've had a fantastic start to the season, but they're gonna go into the second half of the season without their talisman. They're gonna to have to replace him in some way. So already we can see one way in which the World Cup is impacting the Premier League. But the impact of the World Cup on the Premier League isn't only going to be negative, there are going to be some positive impacts as well. We've already talked about the teams who haven't sent many players. That's going to obviously change the way that their second half of their season is going to go. So I want to talk about two of those teams now. The first one is Newcastle, got them on the board in front of me. As we said, Newcastle have only sent five players to the World Cup, and of those five players they've barely played any minutes. So Nick Pope went as a backup goalkeeper to England, played zero minutes. Fabian Schaar played a few minutes for Switzerland. Trippier played a few minutes for England. Bruno Guimaraes, who is their star player, only played 69 minutes, which is nice. And then you've got Callum Wilson here, 48 minutes. Across the rest of the pitch, there's players who did not go to the World Cup, and a lot of them really important players for Newcastle, like Sven Botman, Miguel Almiron, Joel Linton, and Alanson Maximan. So plenty of impetus then for Newcastle to come out of the break from the World Cup into the second half of the season. And Newcastle, as we said, top four at the moment, will this impetus be enough to keep them in those top four spaces and get Champions League at the end of the season? This brings us to Liverpool, who had a fairly poor start to the season, although they were creeping back up by the time the World Cup came around. But Liverpool only sent seven players to the World Cup, again, raising the question of whether or not that will give them positive momentum going into the second half of the season to be able to get them back into those Champion League spots. If we look at those players, so Alisson, the goalkeeper, playing a lot for Brazil, Van Dijk playing a lot for the Netherlands, but then across the board, not a huge amount of minutes from anyone else. Henderson played a bit for England, Darwin Nunes played a bit for Uruguay, but again, we've got lots of did not goes all the way across the board here. And importantly, a load of backup players who didn't go, so Liverpool should be super fresh going into the second half of the Premier League. But most interestingly, I think, is this front three, this really dangerous front three of Mohamed Salah, Roberto Firmino and Luis Diaz. This is a really exciting front three. None of them went to the World Cup, so all of them have had six weeks off. They're all able to recuperate. Luis Diaz is coming back from injury, so he'll have had time to rehab a little bit. And so this front three then is gonna be super refreshed going into the second half of the season. But it's not just the Premier League that sends players to the World Cup. There's a load of leagues around the world which sends players, and those players make a market for Premier League sides. So the Premier League will have been watching the World Cup with interest. Obviously, the players will be known to these teams, but the performances of these players on the biggest stage will make a really big impact on what's going to happen in the January transfer window. So I just wanted to talk about three players who've stood out this World Cup who could actually end up in the Premier League by the time the January window ends. Most importantly, I think soft Sofian Amrabat has really impressed everyone. Sofian Amrabat arrived at Fiorentina as a bit of a chaotic ball-carrying number eight, but since then, under Italiano, he has developed into a really rare commodity, which is a bit more of a tempo-setting number six, who is able to defend positionally, and he's been absolutely fundamental to Morocco getting to the semi-final of the World Cup. He will be on everyone's wish list this January. Gonzalo Ramos came into a game and scored a hat-trick, and it was made more impressive by the fact that he was replacing Cristiano Ronaldo. So everyone will have their eyes on him. He's always been a decent box presence. He's really good at moving in the box, getting in behind, and he's been working on his back-to-goal stuff as well, so he'll be high up on priority lists as well. And then Mohamed Kudus, who plays as a number nine for Ajax, but actually for Ghana, has been playing as more of an attacking midfielder, working as a wide forward on the right and inverting in. And actually, I think he suits that sort of position a little bit more. So his performances at the World Cup will have showed some of the elite sides in the Premier League that he can really perform in those sorts of positions. And it wouldn't be surprising to see him moving to the Premier League in January. We've never had a Winter World Cup in the Northern Hemisphere. So this is, we're not in Kansas anymore, Toto territory for us. But when it comes to the World Cup, it's definitely going to have an impact on the Premier League. Now, some of those impacts are going to be positive, some of those impacts are going to be negative, but there will be an impact, and it'll be fascinating to see how it plays out.
If you liked today's video, please subscribe to the channel. And if you like TIFO, we think that you'll also like The Athletic. If you want the best news, features and interviews about the World Cup, the Premier League and European football, as well as loads of other sports, The Athletic is the place for you. And as part of our special deal, you can get it for £1 per month for six months. See the link in the description.